In this video, we'll look at a piece of vintage Heathkit test equipment, the IM1212 Digital Multimeter. I'll discuss the history and features of this instrument, and we'll look at the front panel controls and inside circuitry. I'll discuss the restoration of this particular unit and say something about the circuit design it used. We'll see a demonstration of the multimeter in operation and then wrap things up with a summary. Heathkit was a manufacturer of electronics in kit form. Their product line included amateur radio, test equipment, and various consumer products. By building a piece of electronics, you could save money and gain the satisfaction of having assembled it yourself. A multimeter is an electronic instrument that can measure a number of different electrical values, typically voltage, current, and resistance. One of the simplest types is the volt ohm milliammeter, or VOM, which is just an analog meter with appropriate switching for different measurement modes and ranges. The vacuum tube voltmeter, or VTVM, used tube circuitry to improve the sensitivity and accuracy of measurements. By the late 1960s, integrated circuits made it possible to implement a digital multimeter where the measured value is shown as numeric digits rather than being read off of an analog meter. In 1971, Heathkit introduced their first digital multimeter kit, the IM-102. It was sold until 1978. A three and a half digit meter, it was quite expensive, $250 in 1976. Heathkit also offered lower cost two and a half digit meters, starting with the IM-1202 in 1973. The subject of this video, the IM-1212, was the successor to the IM-1202. It was identical to the IM-1202 in terms of circuitry and features, but moved from a vertical to a more modern horizontal case without a carrying handle. The IM-1212 also removed the polarity reversing switch that was present on the IM-1202, probably as a cost reduction. In 1976, the IM-1212 was replaced by the IM-1210, which was similar but used seven-segment LEDs and a plastic case, which allowed the cost to be reduced somewhat. The IM-1212 was made from 1975 to 1976 and initially sold for $89.95. My 1976 catalog lists it here at $79.95. Like most Heath kits, it was offered as a kit that had to be assembled by the user. A factory assembled version, the SM1212, sold for $125. The unit was also sold by some electronic schools with their branding on it rather than Heath kit. Units labeled as Bell and & Howell and DeVry have been seen. The IM1212 is a digital multimeter that can measure resistance and AC and DC voltage and current. It's solid state and uses cold cathode Nixie tubes for display. The display is two and a half digits, meaning that it can display counts from zero to 199. An over lamp indicates if the measured value is out of range. Four ranges are provided for voltage and current measurements. For AC and DC voltage measurements, the ranges are 0 to 2, 20, 200, and 2,000 volts, although the maximum input is 1,000 volts DC and 700 volts RMS AC. For AC and DC current, the ranges are 0 to 2, 20, 200, and 2,000 milliamps. For resistance measurements, there are five ranges, 0 to 200, 2,000, 20,000, 200,000 and 2 million ohms. Accuracy is plus or minus 1% for DC voltage measurements, plus or minus 1.5% for AC voltage and AC and DC current measurements, and plus or minus 2% for resistance measurements. AC measurements could be made over a frequency range of 25 hertz to 10 kilohertz. Input impedance is 1 mega ohm. This is not bad and better than VOMs, but low enough that it can sometimes load the circuit under test. VTVMs of the era and higher end multimeters are typically 10 or 11 mega ohms input impedance. The unit can be wired for 120 or 240 volt AC power. The AC input is fused with another fuse in the common input lead. The assembly manual is of the usual high quality that Heathkit was renowned for 
and has extensive troubleshooting hints including oscilloscope waveforms. The unit is housed in an aluminum case painted the Heathkit blue that was standard at the time. On the back is the power cable connection and series number sticker. The front panel controls are very simple and straightforward to operate. A mode switch selects between off, DC current, DC voltage, AC voltage, AC current, and resistance. The range switch selects between five ranges, 2, 20, 200, and 2000, with an additional 200 ohms range that's only used in resistance mode. On the right are three banana jacks for the inputs, a common lead and separate input jacks, one for both current and resistance, and one for voltage. Modern multimeters now use a recessed type of banana jack that's safer, but these were standard at the time. The inputs to the unit are floating, that is, the common input is not connected to AC ground, so it can make measurements that are not referenced to ground. At the left is the display. There are three digits of which the leftmost can only display one. At the far left is the over lamp, which illuminates to indicate an overrange condition. On the bottom are four rubber feet. The front feet have extensions that can tilt up to raise the unit to a better viewing angle. Looking inside, you can see that all circuitry is on one printed circuit board. It's a fiberglass, silkscreen, single-sided board, and as is typical, a number of wire jumpers are required to make additional connections. It uses both transistors and integrated circuits, mostly 7400 series TTL chips. Most of the ICs have Heathkit part numbers on them, an indication that Heathkit was buying parts in such high quantities that manufacturers put custom branding on them. A few of the ICs on this unit have other manufacturers' markings. I don't know if they're original or if this means that they were replaced at some point. All ICs are socketed. There is some point-to-point -point wiring in components on the switches and input jacks. Note the fuse connected to the common input lead. The only high voltage is around the power transformer, fuse, and power switch. As some protection against getting a shock, a piece of insulating cardboard is glued to the top of the power transformer covering some of the high voltage. The power switch portion of the function switch is also covered. The display is two cold cathode Nixie tubes. They're in tube sockets. The third digit only needs to display a 1 and is simply a neon lamp. Another neon lamp is used for the overrange indicator. Both are held in place by a small piece of cardboard. The indicators can be seen through a transparent window. There are 10 trimmer pots that are adjusted when the unit's calibrated. These five 1% precision resistors are also used for calibration. I'll talk about the calibration procedure later. The meter uses a simple but ingenious design. It uses one op amp, an LM301, which implements the AC converter. There are a few 7400 series chips, two 7490 decade counters, a dual JK flip-flop for the leading one digit and overrange indicator, and a couple of quad gate packages for some timing tasks. The Nixie tubes are driven with open collector 7441 BCD to decimal decoders. Most of the analog to digital converter is implemented with discrete transistors. The input being measured, either resistance, DC or AC voltage or current, is converted to a DC voltage within a fixed range. A ramp voltage is used to charge a capacitor. When the capacitor starts charging, a timer is started. When the capacitor reaches the input voltage, the timer is stopped and the timer has a value that corresponds to the value being measured, which is then displayed on the display. The display is updated at the line frequency, so no flicker is observed. Unlike more complicated units, this scheme did not require much circuitry. Later Heathkit designs tended to use a VLSI chip designed specifically for implementing a digital multimeter to do most of the work. Let me say something about the display technology. A Nixie tube or cold cathode display is an electronic device for displaying numerals or other information using glow discharge. The glass tube contains a wire mesh anode and multiple cathodes shaped like numerals or other symbols. 
Applying power to one cathode surrounds it with an orange glow discharge. The tube is filled with gas at a low pressure, usually mostly neon and often a little mercury or argon. Although it resembles a vacuum tube in appearance, its operation does not depend on thermionic emission of electrons from a heated cathode. It's therefore called a cold cathode tube, a form of gas-filled tube, or a variant of the neon lamp. Note that this is a different technology from the vacuum fluorescent displays from the same era which used a heated cathode. Calibrating a DMM is a chicken and egg situation. You need an accurate meter to calibrate it, but if you bought a DMM you probably don't have one. Heathkit solved this by using a Zener diode reference for calibration. The Zener diode varies slightly with each diode, so they measured the Zener voltage and two resistors at the factory and recorded the unique voltage value on an envelope in the kit. The calibration voltage should be marked by the user on the paper glued to the transformer. Calibration can then be done using the known calibration reference voltage as well as a set of precision resistors. I received this unit in September of 2014 from a generous person who offered it to me for the cost of shipping, provided that I make a YouTube video about it. He also sent me an IG-18 audio signal generator that I will cover in another video. The unit came well packed and double boxed and looked to be in decent shape. It was complete with the original line cord but no test leads or manual. A large piece of masking tape on the top of the unit was marked dead and I could hear a few loose parts inside. It was also missing one of the knobs. Opening it up, it looked complete and very clean. A couple of screws inside had come loose, but nothing else. The two pieces of insulating cardboard inside, one marked with the calibration voltage, were no longer glued in place. I carefully powered it up, and to my surprise, it seemed to be working fine, at least for initial check of the ohms and DC voltage ranges. It's still a mystery as to why it was marked as dead. I gave it a good cleaning, removed the old tape and sticker residue on the case with soap and water and goo gone. I cleaned the contacts with contact cleaner and oiled the switches. I re-glued the insulating cardboard to the transformer and neon lamps. There was an electrical burn mark on the case near the common input. Fortunately, it was just carbon and could be cleaned off. I found a set of test leads that would work. Looking at my collection of knobs, I found two that were reasonably close to the originals and decided to replace both knobs rather than keep the one original one so that they would match. I could not find a copy of the manual online, but electrically it seems to be the same as the IM1202 except for the polarity switch right down to the component designations. And I was able to find a couple copies of the IM1202 manual. I did find a copy of the calibration procedure for the IM1212, which was helpful as it seems to be a little different from the one in the IM1202 manual. I calibrated the unit as per the instructions. There are 10 trim pots that need to be adjusted at various steps. As explained earlier, calibration does not require any instruments, although one step can optionally use a frequency counter. It calibrated fine with no issues. Calibration uses the known voltage reference and five precision resistors. I measured the standard resistors using my DMM and they were all within 1%. I tested the unit on all ranges and functions against a modern DMM and it was within specs. Let's see the unit making some measurements. First, DC voltage measurement. You set the mode to DC volts and the range to a suitable value the highest if you're not sure of the value. The input is connected across the C and V inputs. Here we're measuring the output of a power supply set to about 5 volts. For comparison, a modern DMM is also connected to the supply. The result is read directly off the display. The decimal point moves depending on the function and range selected. As you can see, the unit reports values close to what the D modern DMM measures. If the polarity is reversed, you'll typically see a value of zero or close to zero and need to reverse the leads. This model's predecessor, the IM1202, had a polarity reversing switch. I've seen a picture of one example of an IM1212 where the user added a polarity reversing switch. Changing the input voltage, we can see it update the display.
If we get beyond the range, in this case 19.9 volts, the overlamp lights to tell you that you need to switch ranges. Now I'm measuring AC voltage using a variac. We use the ACV range, otherwise it's the same as measuring DC voltage. Current measurement is similar, so I won't bother showing it. Note that for current, you need to use the C and milliamp ohms leads. Current measurements are also made by breaking the circuit and putting the meter in series. For resistance measurements, you put the resistor under test across the C and milliamp ohms leads. Here I've connected to a resistance substitution box. The ohms function has an extra range for 0 to 200 ohms. The higher ranges read in kilo ohms, except the top one, which is mega ohms. Here are the readings with the substitution box set to various values 10 ohms, 22, 47, 100. 220, so we need to switch to the 2K range. 330, 470, 680, 1000, 2200, again going to a higher range, and 3.3K. The substitution box is not particularly accurate, so errors are more likely to be the box rather than the meter. As for current and voltage measurements, the overlamp indicates an overrange. The meter does not use a crystal controlled oscillator, so it drifts slightly with temperature, and I find it takes a few minutes for readings to stabilize. Calibration calls for a 30 minute warm up time. In the last few years, digital multimeters have become extremely inexpensive, with units selling for under $10, although good quality DMMs are generally $100 or more. How does the IM1212 stack up against a modern DMM? To be honest, it's much less accurate, larger, heavier, and not portable. It's not auto-ranging, and offers only a limited set of measurement functions. However, it's interesting as a historical artifact and has a cool retro display. Nixie tubes in particular are now popular for their nostalgia factor, and some companies are offering kits today such as digital clocks with Nixie displays, for example. At the time the IM1212 was introduced, digital multimeters were quite new and just beginning to replace analog meters. At $89.95 in 1975, about $400 in today's dollars, this meter was a very good value. The IM1212 is only made for just over one year, and this is probably the main reason that it does not seem to be very common. You can learn more about digital multimeters and other test equipment in my new book, Classic Heathkit Electronic Test Equipment. The book covers Heathkit's test equipment products, starting with a brief history of Heathkit, an overview of the test equipment product lines, and tips on buying and restoring vintage test equipment from sources like eBay. Separate chapters cover the major categories of component testers and substitution boxes, frequency counters, meters, oscilloscopes, power supplies, signal generators, tube testers and checkers, and miscellaneous test equipment. The appendix provides a list of references and resources including books, websites, and suppliers of parts, manuals, and related products and services, as well as a detailed product listing of every known model of test equipment produced by Heathkit. The book is available from lulu.com and Amazon and retails for $19.95. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please check out my other YouTube videos on vintage amateur radio and test equipment.